For scripture today, I'm going to read from Daniel 1 to 3, and then Mark 13 to 8. And I'm reading from the message. That's when Michael, the great angel prince, champion of your people, will step in. It will be a time of trouble, the worst trouble the world has ever seen. But your people will be saved from the trouble, every last one found written in the book. Many who have long been long de dead and buried will wake up, some to eternal life and others to eternal shame. Men and women who have lived wisely and well will shine brilliantly like the cloudless star-strewn night skies. And those who put others on the right path to life will glow like stars forever. And then Mark 13. As he walked away from the temple, one of his disciples said, Teacher, look at the stonework, those buildings. Jesus said, You're impressed by this grandiose architecture? There's not a stone in the whole works that is going to end up in a is not going to end up in a heap of rubble. Later, as he was sitting on Mount Olives in full view of the temple, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew got him off by himself and asked, Tell us, when is this going to happen? What sign will we get that things are coming to a head? Jesus began, Watch out for doomsday deceivers. Many leaders are going to show up with forged identities claiming, I'm the one. They will deceive a lot of people. When you hear of wars and rumored wars, keep your head and don't panic. This is routine history and no sign of the end. Nation will fight nation and ruler will fight ruler over and over. Earthquakes will occur in various places. There will be famines but these things are nothing compared to what's coming. Watch out. They're going to drag you into court, and then it will go from bad to worse. Dog eat dog. Everyone at your throat, because you will carry my name. You're placed there as sentinels to truth. The message has to be preached all across the world. When they bring you betrayed into court, don't worry about what you'll say. When the time comes, what's on your heart? The Holy Spirit will make his witness in and through you. It's going to be brother killing brother, father killing child, children killing parents. There's no telling who will hate you because of me. Stay with it. That's what is required. Stay with it to the end. You won't be sorry. You will be saved. Blessings on you, Doug, as you bring us the message. What a dream. I see a new world coming. We read a text this morning in the Gospel of Mark, the 13th chapter, which is a common lectionary text. It'll be read in churches across the nation this morning. We don't always read lectionary texts, but today our gospel text is that text. And the text reminds us of life as new as a daily newscast. Many of us were not surprised. We were shocked on Friday evening as we tuned in to discover the bombing and the murdering uh, suicide events of uh, Paris. But this text tells us that there will always be wars and rumors of wars. Uh, we got technology problems here. Got a new, oh, I got something. Did you move that or did I? <laughs> so, the marvelous uh, text, uh, Jesus uh, talking to the disciples. 
And uh, in the beginning of the text, it's not included here on this frame, but Jesus uh, and the disciples are standing outside the city, uh, the, the temple in Jerusalem. And the disciples are drawing attention to the beautiful structure that is there. And they tell us, according to the descriptions, of course, this was the temple that was built just in the time of Jesus. Herod rebuilt this temple. And they tell us it was a beautiful temple, but it was nothing like the first temple that was built by Solomon. It was destroyed when the children of Israel were taken off into exile. And as they marvel about the beauty of the structure, Jesus just kind of says a fact of life. And we know it so well. The fact of life is that Jesus says is, you think this structure is beautiful and means a whole lot? Not one stone will sit on top of another stone here. It'll all be destroyed. Hmm. It's part of the reality of life. We see that happening all around us. Structures being destroyed. We watch as uh, even wonders of the world, structures that uh, have existed for thousands of years across the, the Middle East and into the Far East are being destroyed today by people who are just wanting to destroy things. So, we're not surprised by the loss of life or the destruction of buildings we're shocked, but we're not surprised because Jesus says there will always be wars and rumors of wars. And so this morning, we've been reminded very recently, although the deaths on Friday are simply one more day of a lot of dying in the world, a lot of unnecessary dying, a lot of violent deaths. We could name the places. Baghdad, and others. And so, we remember those who have lost life, and we, as Ladine led us in prayer this morning, reminded of those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. We also grieve what this means for our world, and we been doing that for a while. So we identify with uh, this situation and people are identifying with that in a variety of ways. Noticed on Facebook, even my own children uh, were trying to teach me how to identify uh, these uh, days with those who are suffering loss. So some of you have been participating in that way. We recognize that solidarity as being valuable, important, because we are partners in this world. I read some time ago in the Wall Street Journal, it actually was October, and uh, Jonathan Sachs uh, says in this article that um, uh, the the situation before us, uh, as he describes it, is one in which the world has been caught off guard, caught off guard by uh, the Islamic destruction, uh, the violence, because much of our world has thought that uh, the secularism of our time would, would overcome religion. And, and so to see persons in the name of religion doing what they're doing in the world today, uh, which shouldn't surprise us because people of religion have been doing this for generations, for e eons. So it shouldn't surprise us. But people in our world, as Jonathan Sachs says, are taken off guard by this because they assume that because we've become uh, so educated and well-informed, we don't need religion anymore. Uh, science and technology, uh, the free market economies, uh, even liberal democracy, which we think we can deliver to the world, which we have not been able to do a whole lot of that, um, has failed to recognize that humans are meaning-seeking creatures. There's something about our design that causes us to ask questions. Who am I? What is my purpose in life? 
How should I live? These are all important questions that we ask, and they signify that we are people who need faith, faith of some kind. Now, of course, in this church, we talk about our spiritual tradition in terms of being connected to the Christian faith. Uh, Interesting. You know, I think that the violence of extreme, of the extremists committed to religion are betraying the fact of what the truth of the Bible is about. Now, there have been violent extremists from lots of religious groups over the centuries. Judaism, Christian. Today, we talk a lot about the violent religious Muslim extremists. All three of these streams have their roots in the father Abraham. They all would claim that. And so I believe that this violent, destructive element of the extremists betrays what Abraham and his relationship to God was all about. If you go back to Genesis chapter 12, the promise that God gave to Abraham was is that through Abraham, all the nations of the world would be blessed. The extreme violent wing of all of the religions betray that because what happened on Friday, what happened a couple of days before that in Baghdad, a suicide at a funeral, killing dozens of people, what happened at 9-11, you, you can name the, the times and places, the dates, and go back a long time. Those things betray the blessing. We have some commonality that, that should direct us in a little bit different direction, I think. And yet, we live in that kind of world. We live in a kind of world that uh, is fraught with wars. Uh, before Friday happened, I was looking at this, and, and it depends where you go, uh, how, many, how many conflicts there are in the world today. This particular map identifies about 35, uh, 35 actually, yeah, 35 um, present-day conflicts that are going on in the world. Uh, depending how you count them and, and where you search, you'll find up to 40 of them. Um, and they break them down in different ways. Uh, one particular breakdown is this. Major wars that last year caused 10,000 deaths. Now, th- this is just very simple. It's, not, it's not, even, not even given any calculation to the hundreds of thousands and even millions that are displaced. But these are just deaths, over 10,000. And in this particular one here, uh, they identify there are four major conflicts in the world today where last year, 2014, and continuing now into 2015, annually there are 10,000 people killed or more. Uh, You can probably think of them. You think of Syria. You think of Iraq. You think of Afghanistan. And you can think of Nigeria, the Hook Aram, in northern part of Nigeria. From 1,000 to 10,000, uh, just a war. And uh, there are about 15 of those. And then there are another uh, dozen or 15 that are minor conflicts, only up to 1,000, 100 to 1,000 people uh, killed last year. And then there are a number of skirmishes and clashes um, where are we at in the figures? Uh, uh, somewhere up to 35 or 40, there, there'd be another dozen, maybe, maybe only half a dozen skirmishes and clashes where uh, things are being cleaned up now. It's just uh, the mop-up work. Uh, but they represent like a decade ago where there might have been a major war where 10,000 people were killed in a year. But now there's less than 100 people. Well, just to say, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus told his disciples this, this, is what, this is what's going to happen in the world. You will always hear of wars and rumors of wars. It's, it's, it's not getting any better. It's actually getting worse, it seems. There's more conflict, more problems going on. More people are dying. We talk about people dying. That's where some of us 
are reminded that we have some good news to share with people because everybody's going to die and everybody needs to hear some good news. And that's what the Bible, that's what God's communication is about. He wants to give a message to a dying people. So we may be dying physically, we may be dying spiritually. God's got a message for us. He's got some news for us. He's got uh, a word for us. He wants us to know that he loves us. He cares about his creation. He cares about people who are dying, no matter how that death is happening. Whether they're being martyred for their faith, whether they're dying in a hurricane or a tornado or a a tsunami, God cares about them. And in the faith community, we need to care about people. We have a message that Communicate, that we have a message to communicate that God loves and cares and has done something to address the problems of the world. He sent a Savior, Jesus. Now, everybody, as I've said, everybody dies. Uh, uh, we go to funerals all the time. I uh, had a funeral here just last week. I mentioned at the funeral last week. You know, people who die, I mean, there are people that die all the time, and if you listen to the conversations... Everybody's going to heaven. We all expect to, we all expect to go to heaven. And in this culture, we, everybody expects to go to heaven. And, and, well, there may be some, some uh, serial killers in some place that they have no interest in going to heaven and they might recognize that. But most people, when they die, when you, you talk to family members, they, they're talking about their brother Joe or their dad and uh, now, they're, now they're joining the family circle in the sky and uh, they're singing songs and, uh, uh, or... Uh, you know, I was at uh, one funeral. Uh, actually, I, I was in charge of that funeral, and they, they put a fishing pole in Grandma's casket. Grandma was a cane fisherwoman. Cane fisherwoman. She knew how to catch fish. And they knew that she was going to be catching fish in the great pond in the sky. They just wanted her to be ready. Does it hurt? I, I don't know. It doesn't. Or... Another funeral I saw, they, they put the golf clubs in the, in the granddad's uh, casket there because he was going to spend eternity on the, on the back nine. Glory. That's what he was going to do. Or maybe you heard about the guy who was buried with his motorcycle. Buried with his motorcycle. He had it in his will. That's, he'd let people know that's where he wanted to go. I guess he was going to travel that highway to heaven. But... The Bible has a little bit different perspective on that. The promise of God's love demonstrated is demonstrated for people who receive that love and come into relationship to God. And, and it's deeply rooted in the scriptures. We have a, a second scripture this morning uh, that comes from the book of Daniel. It was read, from a, read for us, Daniel, 1, uh, Gen, Daniel 12, 1 through 3. Now, Daniel's an Old Testament prophet. Uh, we know the story. <laughs> we, we think about, uh, we, we, we wish for the kind of uh, glorious turnarounds. We, we, we look for those events that will transform the situation. And, and you know, the first six chapters of the book of Daniel, uh, you think it, things are going to be turned upside down. I mean, the, the great stories, uh, Daniel and his friends, you know, they don't have to eat the king's food, and they demonstrate such great wisdom. You think, well, such wisdom, they might just send them back to Israel, you know. That, what a deliverance that would be. Or we think of the three friends of Daniel who, were, uh, who, who wouldn't bow down and worship, and they were cast into the fiery furnace. You think, well, now, if that's not a game changer, what is? And you think, boy, uh, they should be sent back to Israel. They should be released from exile. Uh, the, the king is just saying glorious things about them. Now we're going to worship the God of, of uh, these three young men. Or Daniel gets thrown into a lion's den. That should be a game changer when he walks out of the lion's den. And yet, it, doesn't, it didn't change the situation for Daniel. He remained in exile. He understood that they were going to be in exile for 70 years. 70 years. Daniel knew that. He writes about it in his book. So those first six chapters which tell all those stories which we think should be game changers for the world, uh, the only thing they do is, is they teach Daniel and his friends how to have patience. God's in control, is what they want to say. God's in charge. Just wait on him. And Daniel waits more than 55 years, 
taken as a teenager. He waits the, until the time. But it's interesting when he writes, and he writes using this uh, in verse 1 of chapter 12, uh, he says that, uh, that the followers will be delivered, those who are found written in the book. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. See, there's a drawing line, there's a divide. Uh, God has provided for all, but it's not going to happen for everyone. Everyone's going to uh, face uh, a judgment day. Those who are wise, ah, this is good news, shall shine like the brightness of the sky. And those who lead many to righteousness, like the stars forever and ever. Daniel I had a perspective. He was told in this vision. Now, this is a huge jump from chapter 6 to chapter 12. And in the midst of all these other chapters, we kind of get lost in the apocalyptic images and all. But what was going on in there, Daniel was receiving the news as Jesus talks about it. You'll always hear about wars and rumors of wars. And Daniel got some of the details. He got so much detail in chapters 8, 9, 10, and 11 that people don't even believe that he could have written it 500 years before the time of Christ, because the descriptions that he give follow the lines of the things that happen from Daniel's time to the time of Christ. The descriptions of the rulers that come into power, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, all of these things are happening. Well, why, did Dan, why was Daniel given those things? Well, he was told to seal them, write them up in the book. Uh, they were very disturbing to him. As a matter of fact, he was so disturbed by that. At the end of chapter 7, he says, My thoughts greatly alarmed me. At the end of chapter 8, he was overcome and lay sick for some days, appalled by the vision. And then at age 80, <laughs> described in chapter 10, he says, My radiant appearance was fearfully changed and I retained no strength. You listen to the news these days, you begin to feel like that. You feel like our thoughts should alarm us. We become overcome and are sick for days, appalled by what we see. We should be. Our radiant appearance should change to being fearfully. Uh, we should have no strength when we see what's happening in the world. That's what Daniel had a vision of what was going to be happening, and, and that's, what, that's what his experience was. That's how he, he took it very personally. But he had this promise. That God had designed a plan. And I love, I love the plan because it says at the end of this text, but you go your way and rest, for you shall rise for your reward at the end of the days. You shall rise for your reward. Now people say, there was no expectation about resurrection. This is all baloney. This is hogwash. Somebody made this up. The idea of resurrection uh, didn't emerge until after Daniel's time. Somebody, must else, somebody else must have gone back and written this. But you see, you have to follow the footprints of the scriptures. Even the earliest writings, the book of Job, which is considered the oldest writing in the book, there's a concept, the idea of resurrection. I know that my Redeemer lives, and on the earth again shall stand. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, alongside Daniel, all have a vision. Oh yes, it has another tier. They're talking about the exiles coming back into the land, but they also envision a time is coming when a great deliverer and there is going to be an end time perspective. And it's carried on through the Gospels. Each one of the Gospel writers records the words of Jesus, like here in Mark 13 and in other places, about the expectation of a resurrection. The epistles, Corinthians, Paul writing to the church at Corinth, or again to the church at Thessalonians, talks about this resurrection. These are powerful images. Peter, first and second Peter. John, the revelator, records as well. So there's a, there's a whole line, a whole tradition, a whole understanding, interpretation of expectation. And that's why I love my confession of faith, our confession of faith, where we can read, we place our hope in the reign of God and its fulfillment in the day when Christ, our ascended Lord, will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. He will gather his church already living under the reign of God according to the pattern of God's future. Yes, 
We believe in God's final victory. In the end of this present age of struggle, thanks be to God, the struggle between good and evil will be over. In the resurrection of the dead, we're not going to lay in the grave forever. Did you get that? We're not going to lay in the grave forever. No. And there will be an appearance of a new heaven and a new earth. There the people of God will reign with Christ in justice, righteousness, and peace. We believe that just as God raised Jesus from the dead, we also will be raised from the dead. As Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We'll not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. The trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. At Christ's glorious coming again for judgment, the dead will come out of their graves. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Words of Jesus. The righteous will rise to eternal life with God and the unrighteous to hell and separation from God. Thus God will bring justice to the persecuted and will conform the victory over sin, evil, and death itself. We look forward to the coming of a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem where the people of God will no longer hunger, thirst, or cry, but will sing praises, according to Revelation 5, to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever and ever. I'm not making this up. This is our confession of faith. We believe it. As Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through a faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in that time. As I think about this, I'm reminded of another story in Mark's gospel, other gospels as well. I think each one of the gospels, three of the gospels, record the story of the Sadducees who come to Jesus. Sadducees, they have a question. Now the Sadducees, you know, they don't believe in the resurrection. Theologically, they're anti-resurrection. I'm sad for those folks. But they come to try to trip Jesus and they ask him a question about what? About resurrection. They don't believe in it, but they ask Jesus a question about it. Now, isn't that interesting? Here are some skeptical non-believers in a concept, in an idea, and they're going to try to trip, trip Jesus up on that. And you know, there are all kinds of people like that in the world today. They don't believe, but they'll use to try to trip people up. It's kind of, it's kind of like, you know, Easter. We sing those great songs about Jesus being resurrected from the grave. And you know, the people that sing it don't believe it. They sing it because, well, oh, it's great music. It's a wonderful, wonderful song. But they don't believe it in their hearts. And the Pharisees say to Jesus, or the Sadducees, Pharisees, they believed in the resurrection. Sadducees committed theologically no resurrection. But they come to Jesus and they say, now, there was this man and he didn't have any children and he died. And Moses said that when a man dies without children that his brother should marry his widow. He says, yeah, that's what Moses said. That was the instruction he gave. Well, now, the Sadducees say, tell us about this. This man had seven brothers. And he died. And his brother married his widow. There was no children. He died. And so on. She she married all seven brothers and no children. Now, our question is, now, these are people that don't believe in the resurrection. And they say to do, now, whose wife will she be in heaven? They don't believe in the resurrection, so what's the point of the question? The point is try to trip Jesus up. And then Jesus says something very, very profound. He says, well, you don't know, you don't, you don't understand the scriptures and you don't understand the power of God. Ooh, wow. Here are these great theologians, the Sadducees. Got their act together. They don't believe in a resurrection. Jesus says, you've studied all the scriptures, you don't even understand them. And... You don't understand the power of God. First of all, this isn't really relevant to our conversation here, but sometime we should talk about it. Jesus says, first of all, there is no marriage in heaven. People are like angels. And then he says, what does he say? 
Anybody read that text? I think I've forgotten to. Go for it. He says, Moses, Moses was told by God when he received the Ten Commandments, when God came to Moses, he said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jesus, this is Jesus that says, God claimed to be the God of Abraham. Everybody thought they were dead. God is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. Jesus was intimating to these Sadducees who thought death was the end of everything. They didn't believe in resurrection. They thought that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they thought Sarah and Rebecca and Rachel and uh, Leah, they were all dead. They were in the grave. That was the end of it. It's all over. It's done. It's finished. A lot of people to believe that. But Jesus says that's not the way it is. God is the God of the living. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he can be the God of your future. He wants to be. His desire is. That's his plan. That's his purpose. And Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy, according to his great mercy, God loves us. It's his mercy to reach out to us. He's reaching out to us. He's reaching out to all of us who are tempted and in our vile selves are the extremist, violent people. We respond that way. I have done that. I have killed people with my words. I've beaten up people when I was younger. I used violence. My heart needed to be changed. And people of our world need to be changed because God loves us. His desire is, and through his great mercy, he has offered himself through Jesus Christ and the power of God, as Jesus told the Sadducees, you don't even know what that power is. Your lives have not been transformed. You don't understand that you can live again. You can receive eternal life. Great, his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. From the dead. We don't like to talk about this, I know. We don't like to talk about the the distinction that it makes between those who live eternally and those, because the Bible talks pretty specifically about a heaven and a hell. It talks pretty specifically about a left and a right. It talks pretty specifically about a judgment day. And we, we don't like that because we really believe God is love. But the God is love is this point here that it is by his mercy he has offered us by his power to transform us so that we can receive the eternal life that Jesus promises. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And then he says these wonderful words to Martha, the words of challenge on that day in John 11. Martha, do you believe this? You see, it doesn't matter. He can raise Lazarus, and he did. He raised Lazarus that day. But that really didn't matter. Oh, Martha was happy. She was glad that Lazarus was back to life. But she had to go through it all again. She had gone through the grieving process. She had wrapped up his body. She had cleaned it up, wrapped it up, and laid it in the grave. She had cried her eyes out. He was dead four days. And you know what? She's going to have to do it again. Unless she died before he died again. Because Lazarus came back to life, and then he was going to die again. So it didn't really matter what Jesus was going to do with Lazarus. What mattered was, Martha, do you believe this? And so that's my question for us today. Do we really believe it? (laughs) That's what Jesus asks us. Do you believe it? You see, the words that were given to Daniel were that those who were found written in the book would be raised to shine like the stars forever. So, are we found written in the book? 